In this video, I'm going to cover Gibbs free energy. So we've shown already in this chapter that um, in terms of thermodynamics and spontaneous processes, we're usually concerned with two different quantities, the enthalpy and the entropy. So the enthalpy is, remember, a measure of uh, bond strength. So um, whether we're making stronger bonds or weaker bonds and reactions can release heat or absorb heat, be exothermic or endothermic. Um, and entropy is really um, a measure of probability to determine uh, the state that a system will most likely end up in is the state which has the most the microstates. So um, these two quantities are generally what we have to consider when we think about whether a uh, process is spontaneous or not. So sometimes the enthalpy and the entropy can work together to both make a process more spontaneous. So um, there are generally two two different uh, two different very or two different um, ways. So the enthalpy can be either favorable or unfavorable, meaning that it can either lead to a spontaneous reaction and be favorable, or the value of the enthalpy can uh, would cause the reaction to be non-spontaneous or be unfavorable. And the same is true of the entropy. We can say that the value of entropy is either good for spontaneity or bad for spontaneity. It's either favorable or unfavorable. So um, sometimes those two terms, enthalpy and entropy, can both work together to make a reaction spontaneous. Enthalpy is good for spontaneity, it's favorable. The uh, entropy is good for spontaneity, it's also favorable. Therefore, that process is spontaneous. Both, both of the factors that cause spontaneity are favorable. Um, sometimes both of those factors are unfavorable. So the, the enthalpy is bad for spontaneity. The entropy is bad for spontaneity. They're both unfavorable. Therefore, that process is unfavorable for spontaneity, and it's a it's non-spontaneous process. Um, so sometimes the enthalpy and entropy can work together in the same direction, both favorable, both unfavorable. But sometimes the entropy and the enthalpy can work in opposite directions. So I have a, an enthalpy value that's good for spontaneity, and I have an entropy value that's bad or the other way around. So um, is my reaction, in, in those cases, is my reaction spontaneous or not spontaneous? Well, I have to compare the magnitude of the enthalpy and the entropy and determine whether it's more favorable or more unfavorable, which term is bigger. Um, so the Gibbs free energy is a term that really gets to the heart of that interplay between enthalpy and entropy, that these two are, are sometimes work together and sometimes work against each other. We can quantify that relationship between H and S with a term called G, the Gibbs free energy. And um, one way of defining that is the maximum amount of work energy that can be released to the surroundings by a system for a constant temperature and pressure system. So um, that's, that's kind of a mouthful. I think it's easier to say that Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy after we consider the entropy, the heat tax, and after we consider how much energy is available from the enthalpy change in a reaction, how much energy is left over to do work. So Gibbs free energy is sometimes the amount of useful energy within a reaction. Because when we think about H, H tells us the total internal energy of a system. And so um, when we think about uh, the, the, all of the components that are in that system, the chemical components and um, the temperature, and we think about the total internal energy, um, which is a useful, which in itself is certainly a useful quantity to know, but sometimes from a engineering point of view or from a practical point of view, it's more useful to know what amount of energy is available to do work or after we consider the heat tax and after we consider other factors of thermodynamics how much of that total energy is left that we can actually use to move a train or heat up a stove or whatever it is that we're going to do so that's what this g gets at this gibbs free energy so delta g the change in gibbs free energy is equal to the change in enthalpy 
minus the temperature times the change in entropy. So you can see it's enthalpy and entropy are in this, uh, this term for Gibbs free energy and also the temperature. Temperature has an effect on the magnitude of the entropy. When the temperature is low, the change in entropy is small. When the temperature is high, the change in entropy is larger. So um, when we think about the value of delta G, delta G is negative when a process is spontaneous, and delta G is positive when it's spontaneous, when a, a process is not spontaneous. So um, a favorable value for H is negative. When delta H is negative, that means that that is a, a value of H that would lead to spontaneity. And when the value of delta S is positive, that is a favorable outcome for S in terms of spontaneity. So when delta G is negative, that's a spontaneous process. Delta H being negative is favorable, and delta S being positive is favorable. So remember delta H being negative, that correlates to an exothermic reaction when where heat is being released. And so that makes sense. Delta G will be, well, we'll have more energy available to do work when H is negative, because when H is negative, that's an exothermic reaction, and exothermic reactions release heat, and we can use that heat to do work. Uh, if we have a, a corresponding pressure volume change. Um, and when delta S is positive, and remember delta S is the change in entropy, and so when delta S is positive, that's when entropy is increasing, and according to the second law of thermodynamics, that's a favorable outcome for S. So when delta H is negative, heat's being released. When delta S is positive, it's becoming more random. So reactions are spontaneous, processes are spontaneous, when they release heat and when they become more random. So uh, when delta H is, uh, delta A, uh, these are f um, different situations when delta G will be negative. If delta H is negative, that's favorable and large, and delta S is negative but small. So if delta S is negative, that's unfavorable. But if it's small, then delta H being favorable and large is large enough to overcome this unfavorable S. Or similarly, if delta H is positive and it's unfavorable, but delta S is positive and favorable but very large, this favorable term here, the delta S being favorable, that can overcome the unfavorable delta H and still make G negative. And so, you know, we're th just thinking about math here, right? If we want this term to be negative, and when this term is negative, and this term is positive, then that always gives us a negative term over here. So we just think about the interplay between something minus something else, and what the signs of those have to be in order to give us a negative sign over here. That's the kind, that's the kind of thinking that we're doing right now. So when delta G is zero, then a reaction is at equilibrium. When delta G is positive, then that's a non-spontaneous reaction. Um, and when delta G is negative, then that's a spontaneous reaction. So whenever we're at equilibrium, then the reaction has no free energy left. Equilibrium is a, uh, a state in which it seems as if the reaction has stopped moving, right? Like all of the, the the change at which the reactants turn to products and the rate at which the products become reactants is equal. So it seems as if nothing is changing in a reaction that's at equilibrium. So because it seems to have stopped moving, it no longer has a source of energy. It no longer provides uh, movement in one direction or the other. So if I have a reaction at equilibrium and we add more reactants to that reaction, then the reaction will move forward, right? So if I'm looking at this reaction here and it is at equilibrium, if I add more N2, then the reaction will move forward by Le Chatelier's principle, right? And if I have a reaction at equilibrium and I add more NH3, then the reaction will move backwards by Le Chatelier's principle. So we already know what happens to reactions that are at equilibrium. We've talked about this before. Um, looking at the free energy is an another way of talking about the same kind of dynamic, the same situation 
um, that applies with Le Chatelier's principle and reactions that are at equilibrium. So as I add reactant and the reaction moves forward by Le Chatelier's principle, that movement of the reaction, that motion moving forward, is a measurement of energy. Uh, when a system is not moving, then it has uh, zero energy to do any work. But when it's moving, then we can use that movement to do work. Remember, work is um, uh, work is distinct from heat by being um, movement in one direction. So when I can make a reaction move forwards or move backwards in one direction, then that's uh, a form of, of chemical work. And so moving forwards uh, by Le Chatelier's principle, if I add a reactant and the reaction moves forward, then I'm saying that there's energy available for the reaction to go there, and it will keep going there until the reaction reaches equilibrium. So I have a reaction that's at equilibrium. I have a ball at the bottom of the hill. When I add more reactant, I'm pushing the ball up the hill. And what happens after I add more reactant? The reaction's going to move forward until all that reactant is used up and the reaction comes to equilibrium again. And then when the reaction's at equilibrium, I add more product. And so when I add more product, I push the reaction up this way. And as the reaction moves this way, then the free, I have free energy, and we're using the free energy as the reaction moves until eventually all that product becomes reactant and I reach equilibrium again, then the reaction stops, and the free energy is equal to zero. So the free energy is a way of uh, determining the direction of spontaneous change. So it's just, it's kind of like Le Chatelier's principle. If I'm at equilibrium, then there is no free energy left. But if I'm not at equilibrium, then there's some movement toward equilibrium. And that movement is captured in Gibbs free energy. So here are some of the um, different signs of H and S. If H is negative, remember that is exothermic. If H is positive, that is endothermic. So exothermic reactions release heat and endothermic reactions absorb heat. So those are the only two values. Delta H can be zero, or delta H can be negative or positive. So delta H is not, I can't think of an example where delta H is zero. So the two, the two values that you encounter for delta H are either negative values or positive values. The reactions are either exothermic or endothermic. The, rea the values that you can encounter for delta S are positive or negative also. The change in enthalpy sometimes is zero for reactions, um, but uh, it can also be positive. It's generally either positive or negative. And remember, for S, a positive value is uh, a favorable value. That's when entropy is increasing, and the second law requires that entropy increases. And when delta S is negative, that's when entropy is decreasing. That's an unfavorable. So when X, when H is negative, that's exothermic, that's favorable. And S is positive, that's increasing entropy, that's favorable. Then that means that the reaction is spontaneous. It's always spontaneous. It doesn't matter if it's at low temperature or high temperature. H is favorable, S is favorable, the reaction is spontaneous. Here is um, H is positive, that's endothermic, that's unfavorable. S is negative, that's um, Increase, uh, that's uh, decreasing entropy. That means the, si the system is becoming more ordered, not more random. So this is unfavorable. So when H is unfavorable and S is unfavorable, then that process is non-spontaneous at all temperatures. It doesn't matter if it's cold or hot, it's always non-spontaneous because H is bad and S is bad. So here's an example where H is negative, that's favorable, that's good. And S is negative, that's unfavorable, that's bad. So what happens when you have H favorable and S unfavorable? Well, if H is larger, then that means that delta G will be negative, spontaneous. But if S is larger, then that means that delta G will be positive and non-spontaneous. So what determines whether H is larger or S is larger? Well, um, remember the equation, 
temperature. So remember when t is really small, and that means that delta s is small. So delta s in this example here, I have a favorable h and an unfavorable s. So unfavorable s, that's, that means s is bad for spontaneity. So I want my s term to be small. How can I ensure that my bad s term is small? Well, here's s. If t is small, then this whole term will be small because I'll be multiplying delta s by a really small number. The temperature is low. So at low temperature, my, my delta s is small. But at high temperature, my delta s is large. So when I have a bad delta s, an unfavorable entropy, then when the temperature is low, my unfavorable term is small. So that means that it won't matter much. So if, if t is low, it doesn't matter that my entropy is bad. But as the temperature gets higher and higher, then that t is going to multiply by the delta s, making my unfavorable delta s term get even bigger and bigger as the temperature gets higher and higher. At some point, it's going to overcome the favorable delta h, and that's going to make that process non-spontaneous. Um, and finally, delta h positive, that's unfavorable. Delta s positive, that's favorable. So again, now my delta s term is favorable. It's positive. That's a good delta s term. So I want my delta s term to be as big as possible. And when delta s is really big, it will overcome the bad delta h. So what makes my delta s term really large? When the temperature is high. When the temperature is high, it will multiply by my favorable delta t. That will make this whole term very large. And it will overcome the unfavorable delta h and still thereby making delta G negative. So the, the temperature of the, the spontaneity of a reaction can be temperature dependent if one of the terms is unfavorable. right? In this case right here, both terms are favorable. Temperature doesn't matter. It's always spontaneous. In this case right here, both terms are unfavorable. Temperature doesn't matter. If both terms are unfavorable, they're always unfavorable. The reaction is non-spontaneous at all temperatures. If one term is favorable, then it ma the temperature matters. If one term is favorable and the other is not, then temperature matters. And the reason that temperature matters is because it affects the size of delta S. So let's look at some of these reactions, some of these examples here. We can determine what the change in uh, entropy is going to be. Believe it or not, just by looking at this reaction right here, we can say whether delta S is going to be negative or positive. So um, one thing that we look at when we're, when we're looking at a reaction and trying to determine whether delta S is negative or positive, we look at whether there's a change in state or a change of phase. Here there's not. Gas to gas to gas and gas. They're all gas. So there's no phase change. Remember, liquid going to gas would be a big increase in entropy, but liquid going to solid would be a big decrease in entropy. So those are things that we have to consider. In this case, we're going from a gas to gases, but I'm going from two moles of gas to two plus one mole of gas. That's three moles of gas. So I go from two moles of gas to three moles of gas. If I increase the moles of gas, then I've increased the randomness, because if there are more particles of gas, then there's more relative orientations they can take. There's more microstates. So going from two moles of gas to three moles of gas is an increase in entropy. So I know that delta S is going to be positive. And just by looking at this reaction, I can determine whether delta H is negative or positive. Because here I have N2O. So that means I have um, an oxygen that's bonded to two nitrogens. So if we look at this reaction, we draw the Lewis structures for N2O. We have two of these, right? And then that makes two nitrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. Then what happens here? What, what bonds are breaking? Remember that enthalpy, to figure out delta H, delta H is whether I'm uh, releasing energy from making bonds or whether I'm absorbing energy from breaking bonds. And remember, in most chemical reactions, 
I'm not only making bonds or only breaking bonds, so it's usually not as easy as that. In most chemical reactions, you're doing both. You're making bonds and breaking bonds in a reaction. So in this case, you can see that we're breaking a bond between N and O. We're breaking another bond between N and O. So we're breaking two bonds between N and O. And I'm making two bonds, one between O and O, and another one between O and O. So here it would be kind of hard to predict the value of delta H. I'm breaking two bonds and I'm making two bonds. So for this, maybe just looking at the reaction, we would need more information. Maybe we'd have to actually look up the value of delta H, the heat of formation for the reactants and the heat of formation for the products. And we could determine uh, what this reaction is. That's another thing to consider is when we think about the heat of reaction for uh, or the heat of formation for these products, remember that the heat of formation is always zero for an element that's in its standard state. So the heat of formation for N2 is zero, and the heat of formation for O2 is zero. So the heat of formation for the products here is nothing. So depending on what the heat of formation is for N2O, um, and we would be adding uh, an oxygen to N2. So looking at it that way, we can see that we're making a bond from N2. So that would release some energy. So there are ways that we can look at the, the Lewis structures and look at a chemical reaction and try to say, well, what bonds are being broken and what bonds are being formed? And what effect is that going to have on H? Am I breaking more bonds? Am I forming more bonds? Uh, are those bonds weaker? Are those bonds stronger? Um, we can think about the heat of formation of pure elements. So here's another example in the next one. I'm going from three moles of gas to two moles of gas. So what's that going to do for the entropy? That makes the entropy decrease, right? So delta S is negative here. I'm going from three to two. It's the opposite situation. And we think about the um, uh, the, en the enthalpy situation, well, we have the opposite enthalpy situation here, too, because the O2 has a heat of formation of zero because it's a pure element in its standard state. And the O3, um, and the O3 does not have a heat of formation of zero because it's not an element in its standard state. Ozone is not the standard state of oxygen. O2 is the standard state of oxygen. So given that this is zero, the reactant is zero, and the product is not, then we can infer something about, uh, again, the, the, whether I'm releasing energy when I make bonds or whether I'm absorbing energy when I break bonds, just by looking at the structures of the reactants and products involved. So let's look at this one. Delta H, or excuse me, um, H2O goes from a liquid to a solid. So that's freezing, right? This is making ice cubes. I have liquid water and it turns into solid water. So at first glance, it looks like we're not making bonds or breaking bonds. But remember that we actually are, because for a liquid to turn into a solid, I have to make hydrogen bonds, right? Uh, in a solid, the H2O particles are all hydrogen bonded. All of those molecules are hydrogen bonded to each other. And in a liquid, some of those hydrogen bonds are not there, which allows there to be some movement between those molecules. So to go from liquid H2O to solid H2O means creating some more hydrogen bonds. So if I'm making a bond, it's all we're doing in that case is making bonds. Making bonds is exothermic. We get energy out when we make a bond. We absorb energy when we break a bond. So going from a liquid to a solid is only making bonds. Therefore, H is negative. What about the entropy? Well, remember, going from a liquid to a solid is increasing the order. So if I increase the order, then that means I'm decreasing the entropy, right? So, or I was, we could say I'm decreasing the randomness, so I'm decreasing the entropy. So we can generally get a lot of information out of looking at a chemical reaction and determining whether H is going to be negative or positive, and therefore determining whether that process is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And if we can't just determine that by looking at the equation itself, then we can look up these uh, delta H and delta S in a table, 
and determine what their actual values are and determine if they not only if they're negative or positive but what the quantity of negative or positive value is so we uh, went over this a bit when we talked about thermochemistry so the standard state that's that little degree symbol that appears after certain variables the standard state is the state of a material at a defined set of conditions um, so uh, gas pure gas at exactly one atmosphere solids or liquids um, pure solids or liquids in their most stable form at exactly one atmosphere pressure and the temperature of interest which is generally 25 degrees C so uh, we're when we're talking about standard state we're talking about um, a gas gases always have a pressure of one atmosphere solids and liquids are pure solids or liquids at one atmosphere of pressure and a temperature of 25 and anytime we're, we're talking about a solution the concentration of that solution is always one molar these are the standard conditions and so whenever you see that little degree symbol right when we're talking about H not or S not or G not the little degree sign after the thermodynamic uh, variable indicates standard state so that all of those we already know what the value of pressure is it's one we already know what the temperature is 25 degrees C and we already know what the concentration is it's one molar so these uh, we put those values into these equations and that's what gives us these values in a table with the degree symbol with the not sign after So to calculate G naught, there's a few different ways that we can do it. So um, we can calculate G naught um, using the same equation that we've used for H and S. If I know the heat of formation of the products and reactants, then I can calculate the heat of the reaction. If I know the absolute entropy of the products and reactants, then I can calculate the change in entropy for the reaction. And finally, if I know the Gibbs free energy uh, a formation for the products and reactants and I can look these values up in a table then I can calculate the Gibbs free energy of the whole reaction and so remember to do this we just sum the the um, we look up all of the G Delta F values for all the products and, and add them all together and subtract that from the G Delta F values of all the reactants when we add them all together and don't forget you have to multiply by the stoichiometric coefficient so if there's two moles of a reactant you have to multiply its delta G by two and so on so if w this is uh, at G naught right to determine G naught we have to use um, standard variables from a table but if we're not at 25 degrees C I can't use these values anymore because these values are always calculated at 25 C so if I'm at a temperature that's not 25 C then uh, we can use a different reaction or we can use a different equation so um, if we assume that the change in the enthalpy of reaction and entropy of reaction is negligible then we can still uh, calculate delta G naught just by using these variables instead or um, we can use delta G of several several reactions that we add together to give us the reaction of interest and we'll look at a couple of different um, examples of doing this so here are some of those uh, delta G F values from the table so for example if I was looking up H2 gas plus O2 gas makes 2H2O gas. So I'm going to need two of these. So here's my reaction 2H2O gas plus 1O2 gas makes 2H2O gas. Then, in order to calculate delta G for this reaction, I would find delta G for the products H2O gas so and I, I can't forget that I have two of these so 2 times 
the value for H2O gas, which is negative 228.6. And I would subtract that from those values of the reactants. So H2 gas is 0, because remember this is a pure element at its standard state. And O2 is 0, because that's a pure element at its standard state. So minus 0. So delta G for this reaction is... negative 457.2 kilojoules per mole. So um, we can calculate the delta G. Sorry, I forgot my extra symbols here. We can calculate the standard Gibbs free energy of formation by looking up Gibbs free energy of formation values in a table and using this equation, products minus reactants. My reactants in this case were both zero, but you could still look them up on the table. You would just see that they were had a value of zero. So this is one way to calculate delta G. If a reaction can be expressed as a series of reactions, the sum of the delta G values of the individual reaction is the delta G of the total reaction. Delta G is a state function. So um, if a reaction is reversed, the sign of delta G value reverses. If the amount of materials is multiplied by a factor, the value of delta G is multiplied by the same factor. So this is, we've done this before with delta H. This is when we have A plus B makes C C makes D. There we go. Then we add these together. And remember what we do when I'm trying to add together two reactions to equal a third reaction. Anything that's in the reactant and the product that's the same, if I have the same reactant, C, and then I have C as a product, they get canceled out. So the reaction I'd be left over with would be A plus B goes to D. Right? Do you remember doing this before with delta H? And before the idea was this. Delta H1 equals X. Delta H2 equals Y. Whatever these were, are, they, they were usually given. right? And the question would be, this is what the questions were. What is the value of delta H for this reaction? And remember that the way that we would do this is we would try to add these two reactions together to yield this reaction. And when we did that, we'd say, OK, then I have to multiply this, or I have to add H1 plus H2 equals H3. So delta H3 equals delta H1 plus delta H2. Well, we've so all that we've done already for delta H, do exactly the same thing now for delta G. The only difference is that we're going to call it G instead of H. G. 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 So this is called Hess's law when we apply it to delta H. So we can call this We'll just call it Hess's law for delta G. It's the same way. So this is another way that we can calculate delta G. We can look up delta G values from a table and just use the reaction of interest and do products minus reactants. Or we can add two or three different reactions together to give us the delta G of interest by adding delta Gs together. OK, so. Um, what's free about free energy? So we talked about this already. The free energy is the maximum amount of energy released from a system that is available to do work on the surroundings. For many exothermic reactions, so exothermic reactions release heat. That heat can be used to boil water, for example, which can be used to turn a turbine so that can do work. So for many exothermic reactions, some of the heat released due to enthalpy change, goes into increasing the entropy of the surroundings. So it's not available to do work. 
or another way of saying that is if I'm trying to use the uh, energy from example in a nuclear reactor the um, heat that's generated from the nuclear reactions causes water to boil and that boiling water can be used to, it's turned into steam and the steam turns a turbine and the turbine generates electricity so all of the energy that's available in the radioactive material that's heating up that water is not transferred into the heat of the water some of it is also transferred into the heat of the casing that's surrounding the whole nuclear reactor so some of the energy from the nuclear decay it doesn't all go into boiling the water some of it goes into heating up the surroundings and so delta G is the amount of energy that's left after we've paid the heat tax so for example here's another example of a reaction we can look at uh, graphite solid graphite plus hydrogen makes methane gas so we have some solid graphite and we add some hydrogen gas to it and we make a new gas methane gas so this is an exothermic reaction and um, we are making bonds and breaking bonds I have to break a bond between H2 or two bonds because I have two of them so two bonds between H2 molecules but then I make uh, four bonds to carbon one two three four bonds to carbon so I have to break two and I make four so making four bonds we can see that would make uh, an exothermic reaction heat is going to be released because when I make bonds heat is released um, delta S is unfavorable what is unfavorable about this reaction right here well there's two things that are unfavorable about it um, I'm going from two, mole, two moles of gas to one mole of gas so I'm reducing the amount of gas another thing that's unfavorable is that I'm going from two different substances to one substance two different substances can be mixed up in lots of ways one substance can't be mixed up in as many ways so that's also a loss of entropy the good thing is that I'm going from a solid here to a gas so that is an increase in entropy but I'm decreasing entropy because I'm going from two moles to one and because I'm going from two substances to one substance so that's unfavorable change in entropy so is this reaction gonna be favorable is it gonna be spontaneous or not spontaneous well remember delta S equals delta H minus T delta S remember that delta S is unfavorable so if this is a bad term it's uh, gonna make my reaction non spontaneous then I want temperature to be low if the temperature is low then this whole term will be small and my favorable delta H will still make delta G negative but if the temperature is high my unfavorable delta S term will be big and then this will be non spontaneous so at whatever temperature we're at here we are saying that this is a spontaneous reaction because even though delta S is unfavorable it's a small term this is small so delta G is less than delta H my delta H the amount of energy that the reaction is releasing is negative 70 about negative 75 kilojoules that I'm getting from the bond but I only am allowed to spend I can only have 50 kilojoules of energy to spend from that reaction because about 30 kilojoules was used to pay the heat tax so this is how much total energy there is in the system this is the heat tax that was paid this is the amount of energy that's useful to do work Delta G so um, when we think about free uh, energy and reversible reactions the change in free energy is a theoretical limit as to the amount of work that can be done so if the reaction achieves its theoretical limit it is a reversible reaction but remember that um, the chain that this theoretical limit uh, implies that there is uh, no energy being lost to the surroundings and so it's we can never actually achieve the theoretical limit so real reactions uh, some of the free energy or most of the free energy is lost as heat
So not only do we have to pay the heat tax theoretically, but practically even more of the energy than the theoretical heat tax is also lost because some of that and a lot of the energy is used to heat up the surroundings. Remember the light bulb, we put in 100 watts of energy and we only get 5 watts of light energy out. The other 95% of the energy is wasted as heat. Only 5% of that energy was used as light. So real reactions are irreversible because most of the energy is lost as heat. We can't get that energy back. It doesn't, we can't just change the system and the energy goes here and we change the system back and the energy comes back because the energy is lost as heat. Once it heats up the surroundings, we can't gather it back up and put it back into the system.